everyone. Are we ready? Great. Um, hello and welcome back, everyone, at the National Institute for Directing and Ensemble Creation. Can we hear you out there? Online and everyone, friends and family, and colleagues who may be watching. Uh, my name is Andrea Asaf, and I am the artistic director of Art to Action, and very proud to be a co host, co presenter of the National Institute for Directing and Ensemble Creation with Pangea World Theater here in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Minneapolis folks, thank you for hosting us. Make some noise. Uh, Howl around, and we want to let folks know that we'll be live streaming another uh, panel. I do think we have a little bit of sound feedback uh, that we're working on, but uh, we're going to be live streaming another panel on Friday that will feature Twin Cities artists in the theaters of color, uh, Twin Cities theaters of color coalition, and also uh, partners in philanthropy that are working to shift equity. Uh, or the situation of inequity in our field. Uh, that'll be on Friday at this time, 3.30 to 5, uh, right here at the Event Center and with HowlRound Online. Um, so we're super excited that you are all joining us and um, that we get to have this conversation at the Institute uh, featuring some of our international guest artists who are here uh, in Minneapolis with us this year. And I also want to acknowledge that we are on indigenous land. Uh, we're on the land that, of the Dakota and Lakota and Ojibwe people, and that, um, that all conversations between nations, First Nations, are also international conversations. Uh, I want to lift that up, and uh, I'm thankful that we have uh, one of our artists visiting from Canada is also an indigenous artist, Margot Kane, who you'll hear from in a few minutes. Um, but we have this incredibly global panel uh, today, uh, and we have framed this as uh, what we're simply called Global Voices, Artists Responding to a Shifting World. And one of the things that all of us have in common on this panel is that we're all living in uh, contexts that are in some sort, sort of shift or transition. Uh, it, perhaps we always are. Um, but this historical moment seems particularly acute. Um, and so we've invited these artists to talk about being artists in shifting times and contexts, and about their aesthetics, their practices, uh, and um, what we're going to do is hear from each individual artist about their own practice uh, and, and, and the context in which their work happens. And we're going to hear for about five minutes from each person. We will be translating um, to and from English and Spanish with Lucero Miriam and Adeline, who you'll meet in a moment. Um, so we'll give a little extra time for translation. Um, and then after we've heard from each artist, uh, then we'll kind of look for the themes and connections that are emerging in the conversation and, and just have a dialogue um, about that. Uh, we want to inform our live audience, all these fabulous artists who are in the room, that uh, we're not going to take questions live. However, if you have questions, um, we have some folks uh, around the room. Uh, you can see them uh, waving if you're here, um, who will take written questions. And so they have post-it notes. And if you have a burning question, just make it somehow visible or known that you would like to write on the post-it note, and then they will, um, they will deliver those up to us during the panel. And, uh, and if we have time, we'll take some of those. And if we don't have time on our live stream, uh, we can address them in, in our institute uh, process together later. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, invite each artist to introduce themselves and tell, them, tell us all a little bit about their work and context. And we are going to begin with Margot Kane. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Margot Kane. I'm pre Soto from Alberta, Canada. And presently I reside in Vancouver, Canada. 
the home of the Kosevich peoples. That's the territories that I live on in Vancouver. I am a performing artist. I was raised um, by a non-native family primarily. I was given up for adoption by my mother, the middle child of three children. She was encouraged to give me up by the Mother Superior, by the church. She was Catholic. Thankfully, I say, I was adopted by a man who was not religious, a blue-collar worker, a family uh, that had immigrated, settler people, hard-working people, caring people. And my, uh, my father, my stepfather, was married to my auntie. So when I was very young, my aunties would come and visit me from my native family. And so I always uh, felt very loved. And when I went through any kind of identity problems later in life, through racism within and without our family, I still knew I was loved. And I think that has carried me a long way through all the struggles and the challenges that I've had. I was always a storyteller, always a singer, a dancer, always making events happen. I'm a natural producer. <laughs> so I had my first dance company when I was 11, and I, I created new events in the neighborhood, and I was a very active child. In uh, high school, I really uh, began to move into theater, singing, uh, dancing. And I was always called upon to do something, whether it be in the musical, or sing with the big band, or be in the drama club. And so I enjoyed uh, developing all of those skills and learning uh, and playing with my fellow actors and players. But as life happens, out of school and into the world and the professional world, I found that the first works that came uh, for Indigenous people went to white actresses. So I got to play the understudy. Um, I found that through the first years of my professional life that I was able to play a lot of different characters. I was young, I did children's theater, I could choreograph, I could choreograph the, the, the town musical, I could do all of these different things, but when I was called upon to uh, play in the only indigenous play that was being presented, and that we knew of in Canada, the ecstasy of Rita Joe, I had to do my research around the peoples, my people, my people who were uh, moving into the cities, living on skid row, struggling with social services, not finding work, having being marginalized. And as I did that research, I connected with my people and all of the social workers and crisis workers and, and uh, youth workers that were working with our peoples in the city. And then from then on, I was connected to my community in a, in a very profound way. I am a senior artist in my country as a Native woman. I have a company called Full Circle First Nations Performance, and uh, we're in our 26th year. It's been a slow journey. Very slow. We have an annual Sick Festival for the last 18 years. Because our funding was very small, it was a place uh, where we could gather all kinds of different performance all levels of, of professionalism and present a, a, a stage for them and give them an audience and bring our people into the theater or into the sp very spaces that we use. We're very conscious to build our own audience. We weren't so concerned about the non-native theater going audience. We are interested in telling our own stories in our own way, with our own people, directed and pro produced by our own people. Recently, uh, we have been faced with a challenge in our country with the emergence of um, a Quebecois um, director, white director, male, Robert Lepage. Very well known, some very, very good work, but always um, telling the story for us. 
the show is called Kanata. And just like Slave, which has just erupted into the national press, where there's, he's telling the story of black people with no major black characters on stage, he's doing the same with our story. Working with Théâtre du Soleil out of Paris. The indigenous francophone community rose up, wrote a big letter. Uh, recently, this is within the last 10 days, everybody is mobilizing, the, the press is out. Uh, we are tired of people telling our own stories for us, coming and doing our, their research with us. They don't listen to what we have to say. They, they, they mislead the press by saying they're consulting with us, but they're really not paying attention to what we are all saying. Whose lens, whose artistic lens are you seeing this production through? Where are the indigenous voices within the creative cast? Where are the indigenous um, associates, uh, associate directors, or, or designers, or people? Where are the indigenous people within this show? Because we, after all, are the first peoples of this land. And in our own country, we have been continually denied the space and the resources to tell our own stories. Uh, I just want to uh, close by saying, um, we're now mobilizing the Anglophone Indigenous community. It's an incredible time for us because we're a big country, like the U.S. is and like many other countries. We're trying to connect to each other and move and work together towards, um, towards um, equity for us all and opportunities to work and meet each other across the countries. So I'm very excited to be here to share this story and these ideas with uh, this group of people. And uh, thank you very much for your, your, your words of support and encouragement and your welcome to this land, the Ojibwe and Dakota People's Lands. All relations. Thank you, Marga. I also want to acknowledge uh, that Margot has just recently received uh, the Order of Canada, which is a very high honor. And uh, also uh, want to say that I think uh, I can say for all of us that we are um, very uh, happy to have the opportunity to stand in solidarity with the work that you're doing in Canada, and this is also an issue that is erupting and very relevant uh, in the United States across multiple communities of color right now. And so it's a great conversation to be having that I think we'll return to throughout the Institute. Um, and so now I'd like to uh, pass the microphone to uh, Lucero Mayan and Adeline Carreras, who will be translating and, and allow them to introduce themselves. Hello, buenas tardes. Muchas gracias por estar aquí. Eh, muchas gracias a Art Action y a Banaje World Theater por darme este privilegio y este honor de estar aquí y estar con ustedes en estos momentos tan difíciles en Nicaragua. Hello everyone, my name is Adeline Carreras and I'll be translating for Lucero, I'm for, uh, office manager at Pendia World Theater. Lucero is very happy to be here and thanks everyone for being here especially in these difficult times that we are passing through in Nicaragua. So when I translate, I will be speaking as if I was her, and I will say exactly as I see it, what she, as I think it, what she's saying. Quiero hablar ahora de, de cómo yo llego eh, al oficio de la dirección escénica. Este es una, una, voy a contar, tratando de sintetizar una pequeña historia, eh, es una historia de casi 40 años. I'll be talking about um, uh, directing scenes, and I'm going to be telling it through a story that is about a 40-year-old 40 40 year story. I'm from Mexico. I came to Nicaragua when I was only uh, 19 years old. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Muy claro. Y yo creo mucho en el poder de la ficción. Y yo estaba en México viendo un documental 
sobre la situación en Nicaragua en 1979, cuando el pueblo estaba luchando en contra de la dictadura de Somoza. Y yo vi el rostro de una mujer and she saw the face of a woman en un documental, in a documentary con una bandera with a, with a flag, arriba de una, de una iglesia at the top of a church, celebrando celebrating la, la, el, el, la lucha contra la dictadura celebrating the fight against the dictatorship. entonces yo dije yo quiero estar ahí she said, I want to be there. That's my calling. quería ir en busca de la utopía I wanted to go in search of utopia. y fui And so she did. Dos meses después de que yo llegué, two months later after she arrived, fundé el teatro que dirijo actualmente, que es el Justo Cino Garay. She founded the theater where she now leads, which is the Justo Cino Garay. Justo Cino Garay. Justo Cino Garay. To that she leads to this day. Cuando llegué, yo en principio en México yo quería ser actriz. When she arrived in Nicaragua, in Mexico, when she, uh, before she came to Nicaragua, she wanted to be an actor. Pero cuando llegué a Nicaragua, me di cuenta que la realidad era tan poderosa y que era mucho más importante que actuar en otros que actuar aquí. She realized when she got to Nicaragua that it was the reality of what was happening was so important that she decided others to be on stage instead of her. Entonces, me convertí en profesora de actuación. So that I became a professor of, act, of acting. Han pasado casi 40 años. 40 years have passed. Y he formado muchos, cientos de, de actores. And she has developed hundreds of actors in, through her theater. Por casualidad, aquí hay un actor de mi grupo que por asuntos de amor mm -hmm. está en esta ciudad y él es parte de mi grupo. Oh my goodness, for, so by, by, uh, by the grace of God, I'm going to say there's somebody here from the same theater that she founded. Please stand up. <laughs> Okay, at that time in Nicaragua, theater was on the streets. There were no real uh, stages, real theaters, where performances were being held. Entonces fundamos la primera sala de teatro independiente del país en 1986. And in 1986, we founded uh, the first theater space, theater stage in uh, Nicaragua. Particularly for performance. Desde entonces tiene programación permanente de teatro y de cine. Since then, it has had permanent uh, performances in theater and in film. Tampoco había un público de teatro. Y entonces construimos, ayudamos a construir este público de teatro. So there was not accustomed to have uh, people to show up to the theater, go to a specific space to see theater. So we built those that audience. Todo esto dentro del contexto del proceso revolucionario de los años 80. All this within the context of the revolutionary process in the 1980s. Y hacíamos y nuestra estética de ese entonces es una estética relacionada con ese movimiento festivo. So our aesthetic of that time was uh, with that revolution and that sense of festivity and celebration. Y la metodología estética era una metodología más relacionada con la creación colectiva. Okay. Y, um, The collective methodology was more of a collective vision, a, coll a collaboration within the people, so ensemble. Después, en el año 1990, el Frente Sandinista de Liberación Nacional perdió las elecciones. Then in 1990, uh, the Sandinista National Movement, they lost their election. Y la historia nos cambió de la noche a la mañana. And the history changed, switched overnight. Y de 300 grupos de teatro desaparecieron todos, quedamos alrededor de 10. And of 300 uh, theaters, that, 300 grupos, grupos de teatro. From 300 groups of theater, theater groups, only 10 were left. Quedamos muy pocos. Very few of us were Sobrevivimos left. únicamente los que habíamos generado mecanismos de autogestión. The groups that were left were the ones that were able to uh, build uh, audiences and ways to uh, gain income. Entonces me convertí en gestora cultural. Then she became a cultural promoter. Y después fundamos en 1995 Then they founded in 1995 a, a theater festival, an international theater festival. 
Y como no había quien dirigiera, yo me dediqué a dirigir eh, puestas en escena. Since there was nobody to direct, she decided that she would do it. <laughs> Pasaron 16 años de gobiernos neoliberales. 16 years of neoliberal uh, governments passed. En una situación de orfandad, de mucha tristeza. In a situation where we were orphaned and it was very uh, sad. Y entonces nuestra estética cambió. And so then our aesthetic changed. Hicimos un teatro que nosotros, una estética que nosotros le llamamos menos es más. Mm -hmm. An aesthetic that they call less is more. Una estética mucho más contenida. Eh, más eh, más interna más íntima pero más poderosa an aesthetic that is more contained more intimate but yet more powerful mm. y a partir de los últimos años and since the last couple of years nos dimos cuenta que estábamos muy contentos con esta estética pero que estábamos perdiendo público we were very happy with this type of aesthetic of less is more but we were losing audiences entonces aprendimos la, de, juntamos lo mejor de la estética de los años 80 so we uh, combine the best of, we, of our aesthetic from the 1980s con la otra estética de, de with the most current aesthetic of, of less is more y trabajamos mucho y trabajamos un, 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 una estética que le hemos llamado eh, que le hemos llamado eh, eh, estética y participación ciudadana so they have developed this aesthetic that is called otra vez una vez más eh, estética y participación ciudadana so uh, a new aesthetic that incorporates uh, citizenship a participation y en la última etapa como no había obras eh, que hablaran de las cosas que a nosotros nos duelen y nos interesan, empecé a escribir. In the last few years, since there was no real um, uh, theater work or, or plays that were talking about the reality that we were living, she decided to start writing also. En este momento estamos viviendo una situación muy complicada en Nicaragua, donde hay muchos muertos um, y hay un éxodo masivo de la población. Um, at this moment, we're living a crisis in Nicaragua where there's a lot of dead, um, a lot of people leaving, uh, exiled, uh, lots of suffering. And then um, uh, two months ago, she has received death threats to her person and to the theater. And she was in Mexico for a month um, to stay away from these threats. Y ahora decidí regresar. Porque tengo un compromiso con mi grupo y con Nicaragua. She has decided to return because she has made a compromise with her group and with Nicaragua. Y eh, es, esto nuevo que estamos viviendo está de alguna manera modificando también nuestra manera de ver el teatro. And this moment that we are living in right now is also modifying our aesthetic. This very moment. Yo todo our... esto para decir que la realidad nicaragüense ha influido nuestra nuestra obra artística y nosotros también hemos influido. Hay muchos tiempos pero no el tiempo. Hemos so, influido en la realidad nicaragüense. Muy okay. bien. Um, all this to say that the what is being lived in Nicaragua, the people are living in Nicaragua, has influenced all the work that we have done over the 40 years that they have been a theater. So whatever is currently happening, whatever they are living, that's what they incorporate into their work. Hay una, una cosa que sí la tenemos muy clara, que el compromiso fundamental en este momento es con la atención y con nuestro propio grupo de trabajo. The most fundamental compromise that they have, por favor, dilo de nuevo. Que no sabemos qué vaya a pasar en Nicaragua, pero lo que sí tenemos claro es que nuestro compromiso es con el teatro, con la gente más desposeída y con nosotros mismos como grupo de teatro. So the big compromise that the theater and her herself has towards her group, towards her people, towards Nicaragua, is to always speak about the reality that is happening in Nicaragua, that is happening with people, whether people who are dispossessed, people who don't have a voice, that is their, their mission. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Compromiso also means promise or commitment in Spanish, and um, uh, just to, to clarify that. Uh, what did I say? Compromise. Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, and uh, I also want to just appreciate and acknowledge and be thankful, grateful 
for the courage uh, that uh, it takes to do your work, and I, I think for all of the artists on this panel and this moment that you're living through. And uh, so thankful that Lucero and everyone on the panel is here with us now. Uh, I also want to say I've had the honor of performing in Lucero's festival, and it was one of uh, my shining moments in my life as a theater artist, and I'm so glad that you're here. Um, so we're going to uh, pass the microphone, she's already got it, <laughs> to Khalud, uh, and to hear about your work. Thank you. Marhaba, uh, assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, my name is uh, my name is Khulud Tawaf, and I am from Damascus, Syria. Uh, I was born and raised in Damascus, and uh, I lived in the United Arab Emirates for a little bit. That's where I got my undergrad degree in mass communication, uh, and that's when I decided that I want to pursue uh, a degree in theater directing. And I came to the United States in 2012, uh, and I've been living in the U.S. since then. And Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, I'm actually, I went to school there and I'm an artist in residence with Peter Square and I've been going around the country uh, doing fellowship, artist uh, and internships and, and more training and skill sets that I'm interested in um, building my skill set with and so on. Um, you need to be for a moment. Um, I, you might want to turn my microphone off while the panelists are speaking. Uh, it is, you can't, as you're living in the United States now in 2018 with the Syrian passport and with the hijab, disappear as much as you wish to sometimes. Uh, so that's a daily question for me and what that means uh, and a daily decision. and. Uh, um, a lot of time I think what is next uh, and of course I dream of the day I can go back to the past um, and I know it's coming uh, uh, yeah what I want to share for another term some of this will come up and happy to answer more questions thank you uh, okay All right, uh, we're just going to pass this microphone and uh, that might make it easier. So, uh, thank you, Khalid, and it's so great to have you here. And uh, I'm going to pass the microphone to Ntkozo. Okay, hello everyone. Hello. 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 I am from South Africa. I'm from a little village called Guamdayane. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> That's what it's called. It's a little village on the rural outskirts of um, the province of KwaZulu Natal. And I work for the University of KwaZulu Natal and have been working there since 2008. Um, and, and before that, I, you know, I did freelance work a little bit as we all do. <laughs> we wake up, you know, we grow up dreaming to be actress. No one that's going to be his Everyone's gonna love us. And we're gonna be rich and we're gonna live in a mansion. You know, kids in Africa dream about those things too. Um, but when I was at university, I discovered that there was um, more to theatre than just entertainment. Um, I, I discovered other functions to theatre, like education, social development, um, advocacy, etc. etc. Um, and at some point, I you know, made a choice to go into the, the teaching phase. Um, partly because my mother said, you, I always knew you were going to be a teacher. And I did not like that, but you know. <laughs> There, there were lots of elements of truth in what she, you know, in what she says. She said, I, I know you better than you know yourself. Um, and so I, I embraced, um, you know, uh, the call into the teaching space uh, without letting go of the other dreams, of course. So over the years, what I've learned to do is to integrate my interests into the teaching space. So, um, 
you know, if I want to go and work in communities, I make sure that in the theatre and development theatre studies module, uh, I create a space where young people then get to go into communities as part of the, 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 the studies that they are doing. So I continue to be engaged and work as a mentor for the young people as they develop their own craft and learn in the same way that I learned um, about multi-functions of, um, of theatre. Um, um, so, so one of the things that Andrea wanted us to talk about was this idea um, of, um, you know, shifting times. Um, and as a nation, we, we, we are definitely shifting again. <laughs> you know? And it feels quite upsetting because we are a young democracy and we were just, you know, crawling nicely, making baby steps, you know? Um, and Nelson, Nelson Mandela, whose birthday it is today, would have been 100 years old today. <laughs> what he has contributed to, uh, you know, to what was introduced to us as the Rainbow Nation and was a very strong concept when he was alive. However, that promise of a, a Rainbow Nation has been eroded um, in the latter years. You know, there's a sense of doubting the, the Rainbow Nation, of doubting, of questioning even the legacy of Madiba and his contributions. So it feels like our nation is divided again. You know, we were, we were building nicely to this, you know, finding. Obviously, it, it was not yet a rainbow nation. It was learning to become a rainbow nation. Um, and, 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 and different narratives have challenged that to a point where, um, um, you know, politically right now, they, there's a lot of, there's a lot of disagreement between parties, and I guess that always happens in every country, but there's also infighting within political parties. So the, the, the political parties themselves are not agreeing about the way forward for who we are as a nation, and as a result you see the residues of that tension um, uh, affecting the nation. And though they, you know, there might be spaces where they can be communicated, um, you, you, you see it on Twitter, you see it on social media, um, and, and some of, you know, so, so racial tensions uh, have been popping up again, um, but also gender tensions. There's been a lot of gender tensions in our country and a lot of slaughtering of young women um, that has been happening quite a lot. So there seems to be um, a sense of anger towards each other, underlying anger towards each other. So, so it feels complex. It feels like you'll be doing that again. We go, e, 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 what's going on? Who are we? What are, you know? What you know? What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? Who do we become? Um, and so, for me, again, these dialogues. Complexities find their expression in the teaching space because that's where I am. Um, and, and one of the spaces in which that happens is the directing space where I mentor young people as, as, as directors. Um, and I chose the angle of adaptation because I didn't want to impose um, on, on them um, in terms of what material they, they use. I didn't want to choose a particular direction. So it's the second year I'm doing that module. When we first did it, um, I said an adaptation of a classical text. And it was interesting that young people then chose European texts. There was a Macbeth. There was a... Um, there were two Shakespeare's. I can't remember which one. Which was the other one. Um, and, 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 and that was curious. You know, so this year I decided to shift that a little bit and say you could choose any text from anywhere in the world. It could be a theatre text, it could be a prose, it could be a poem, it could be any 
anything. Um, and it's really interesting to see the, the, the shift in the themes that the young people that we decided to work on. So the gender issue came up um, quite strongly with uh, two plays, Janai Barrera's Eclipse uh, was one of the plays that was adapted, you know, looking at the power dynamic, gender dynamics of power within gender and this anger that's going on between so the one director wanted to look at that. The other one was Doza Kishange's for colored uh, girls who have considered suicide in the rainbow is enough. Um, and, and, and a sense of reclaiming the text, those texts being reclaimed for their context. There was a lot of translating into Isuzu, um, but also reimagining the scripts completely. Um, um, But the characters find the aesthetic that is unique to their South African context and location. Um, and somebody did a, a, a 12 years in a slave into one woman show, um, trying to look at the voice of a woman that has been suppressed for so many years. And she had never seen stories of women in slavery stories. But also thinking about this woman whose heritage is in Africa, but now finds herself in another land. I love uh, this, this one line that Ntozo just said, which is, what are we going to do, how will we do it, and what will we become? And I think those are questions that in the United States and our current political context resonate very strongly for us here as well. Um, I'm now going to pass the microphone to, uh, to someone who is, is also a great honor for me to share a panel with uh, because his critical writing as a scholar, uh, dramaturg, and artist uh, had a profound influence uh, on me, uh, my development, and my understanding of issues such as appropriation uh, when I was um, learning how to be an artist. And so I was. A great honor to sit next to you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, it's a great honor to be with all of you. You are very, very stirred by where you're coming from, your struggles. I'm going to just absolutely uh, respond immediately to Margot. And when Margot is talking about this ongoing crisis, negotiation with the director, Robert Lepage, this representation of a play around indigenous, where the indigenous are accented and the indigenous are erased. You know, it takes me back to 1977 when my intercultural journey began. Now, I don't know if you guys may remember this. In 1977, Peter Brook had this huge production. It wasn't Marmar again 10 years later. So this is a production called The Eek. And Eek referred to an African tribe. state of misery, uh, they were literally killing each other. Uh, they were victims of a uh, typical deviation from their own natural habitat. And uh, a very controversial but important anthropologist, Colin Turnbull, had written an anthropological study about And Brooke had done a kind of uh, an adaptation of this anthropological study. So now in this uh, intercultural pitch, as it became, was a big, big uh, you know, cause of celebration and the global circuit, it was appalling actually. Because only the anthropologist character spoke the language, which was either French or English. And the rest of the character who were made up of international actors based in Paris babbled. They spoke a non-verbal language. They spoke gibberish, basically. And this was seen as some kind of great, you know, directorial strategy, you know. And it amazed me how in 1977, when I saw I saw this a little later in 81 actually in La Mama, uh, I, I was appalled by this representation, you know, uh, because it's so steeped in a kind of inferiorization, they don't have language, they can't think, you know, they're primitive, etc., etc. 
So listening to Margot, I'm not saying that this is what is going to happen with the Nepashri, but you know, my first uh, intervention when I considered something like the I said, is this right? Or is this something? I think it was a very strange question to be asking in the theatre at the time. We never asked that. Yet. This is the right thing to do. We always talk about truth and we talk about, you know, yeah, this is artistically yeah. next. I think this is right. Yeah. You know, and I find that it's a strange thing that the more things seem to change, the more they remain the same. Yeah. You know, that is the same, we're just reinventing the wheel, you know. Yeah. So uh, I don't want to go into uh, the critique of this kind of interculturalism. It's based on a kind of universalism. It's based on a kind of right that I have a right to represent other people because I have artistic truth. I am an artist. I'm an artist as an artist. I have every right to do whatever I want. And to deal with questions relating to ownership or questions of representation. Today we are not living in that world. We are justifiably upset about these things and angry about it. And I think what we can be positive about you know, today is that there are groups like uh, yours, Margot, and many other groups that are not going to take this shit any longer. Platitudes, which are actually very, very arrogant kinds of assumptions of representation. So, I mean, just to be more positive, here in this room, we have gathered here from many, many different uh, backgrounds. And, you know, apart from the intercultural, a very important concept for me and Andrea is the intracultural, which is the, the, the differences that exist within particular regions. So, you may be all coming, many of you may be coming from the United States, but we know if you're in Arkansas, it's not quite the same thing as being in Boston. And it's not quite the same thing as being uh, in Minneapolis, you know. And within Minneapolis, you know that there are different kinds of communities, there are different kinds of tensions. I've always felt this is the most important thing to think about, which is the little differences. Not just the big differences, but the little differences, because if you don't pay attention to the little differences, they're likely to fester and explode. So, the thing is, here we have an opportunity to really test both the little differences and the bigger differences within a larger global scenario, and I'll end over here, where we're all facing the same problem. And the problem is right-wing authoritarianism is on the rise in just about every part of the world. Yeah. So what are we doing about it? And what can we in the theatre world really do about this? This is what I would like to share. process. 
and, uh, and our aesthetics change as a, as a result. Uh, and also this question uh, about ethics and what is our responsibility and the ethics that we have as artists and as producers or uh, presenters around representation. Uh, the, the U.S. is uh, also struggling with this very strongly. Um, I was recently involved in a protest with um, against a Broadway uh, remount uh, at the Muni uh, concurrent with the TCG conference that resulted in or led to a very powerful statement of theaters of color coming together to basically say what was so said was we're just not going to take it anymore. We've got to hold each other accountable to whether we are continuing colonization or trying to engage in decolonization. Uh, and so, um, so we have the, on the floor, I will say, these questions of um, representation and how our aesthetics change in shifting times and contexts, and our ethics and responsibility, ethics and responsibility as of us. Um, and I would like to just open it up to who would like to continue the conversation on the Before you represent anything, you've got to be able to enter the 
this space. So we're also really talking about rights of admission. And a lot of institutions to this day, I think, have closed doors. So most uh, people coming from minor, minority migrant to immigrant backgrounds uh, may just walk past the theater without ever feeling that they have an entitlement to enter it. You know? On the question of representation, on the one hand, there's stereotyping, as you pointed out. But today, for example, in the refugee crisis, there are new uh, dramaturgical territorial strategies where so-called real refugees are now incorporated into the mise en scene. This is very common in Germany, for example. And uh, I had a very disturbing experience once. So on the one hand, you can say, wow, how democratic all of this is. We're the biggest theater in a big German theater festival. You've got 25 refugees on stage, so-called real refugees. They've been incorporated into the mise en scene. At the end of the play, there's a standing over the refugees are taking their bows with everybody else. The play ends, you go out into the lobby and there's a little discussion and there are no refugees sitting at the table. So they're on, they're on the side. Okay? And they are once again being represented. You know? Now, of course, there have been challenges to that that the people have learned from that mistake. So when I saw that, I said, what has really changed? You know, in allowing them to enter that space and then incorporating them into the day, but at the end of the day, if they're not allowed to speak yeah. about what that experience is for them, yeah. then what's the point? Yeah. Um, so, um, I think I've been seeing that in a different way to the, 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 the students that I, I work with. For example, one of the students who did an adaptation of uh, Death in the King's Horseman by Mune Soyinka. And it was very intentional, he turned it into a two-hander. Wanting to look at multi generational relationships between fathers and sons, and was very intentional about you doing the entire play in Isizu and completely rewriting that script and representing narratives of young Zulu boys and their dislocation. They are trying to reach, to reach out to the next generation and understand what it is to be a man and a father and a son and how to pass a legacy on, etc., etc. What was very interesting for me as somebody who comes from a different generation to them, in the process I started asking, but what about the audience? Are they going to understand? I'm now panicking now. Who I'm worried about? The white audience. That's who I'm worried about. And this young man put me in my place. <laughs> and was like, no man. Gifuna is because this is the story that I want to tell. These are the voices that I want to represent. So I find what's happening with young people in South Africa is that they, they are putting themselves at the center of the conversation. And they are saying, let everybody else be uncomfortable. While I grapple with the things that matter um, to me. And the, the ripple effect of that was that the audience, then when the performances happened, there were scenes where the, the boys would start doing the scene and go into a song and the audience would just join in. Ooh. Without being invited to join in because they feel they are being represented on stage. They feel that the stories they are seeing on stage are about them and therefore the theatre etiquette of sitting quietly in the dark and does no longer apply. The spontaneity of African audiences and participation and speaking back to the audience, to the performance, then starts happening. And, and it's been an interesting um, transition to observe with this young um, I want to pass the mic on. <laughs> Um, back to uh, Marco and Lucero to, uh, to continue the conversation, but I want to keep coming back to this um, question of, of how. How we do what we do makes all the difference, right? How that uh, talk back or post-show dialogue was designed rewrote the entire show, and, right? And, uh, and the choice of in what language to perform. Uh, 
how we represent ourselves or even um, collaborate with uh, other artists of color who might have a contextually different story but um, but a similar historical experience. And, and this is this question of the aesthetics and all the choices we make around the the work of art itself, the how is is what makes all the difference. The, like the saying, the devil is in the details, right? It's in the details of the how. Um, but I, I also want to go, open this up uh, and to uh, Margo and Rosetta to um, join in on any part of the conversation that you are uh, moved to respond to. I think I want to talk about um, the training program that we began. And it was uh, myself and my colleague who was not native. He was Scottish. Scottish through and through. Uh, he still carried his uh, ticket to, uh, to uh, Woodstock in his wallet. <laughs> he was, uh, he is uh, a very physical theater person, with a dancer, uh, a director, a clown, taught a clown, taught. He still has a lineup of people around the block to get into his workshops. Because of his, he was very egalitarian, he was very he was a listener, cared, very esoteric in a way, but we we shared a language. And I guess that's partly what I'm talking about when I talk about it. So I, I've been returning to the notion of language. What language are we using to describe what we're doing? Uh, am I being understood by the group that I'm working with? Uh, am I am I discovering a language as I go along? I, I'm I'm not a trained university person. I I was just uh, I went through dance classes and I went through uh, a part time theater program because I had lots of skills already. So I I just picked up the classes and the workshops along the way, and I tried all kinds of different things. But when we began to develop our training program, really the issue was around voice. We didn't, we didn't train people to be actors. We trained whoever came and wanted to express their artistic, artistic discipline and to find their voice and to voice that in a way. So the work is very interesting that way. Um, it's very hard to do. With, with some people because we're not used to being uh, given the freedom <laughs> to discover who we are through the process and to wander around and not know how we're going to voice ourselves. But it's a very rewarding uh, kind of training. And the result of some of that work was that we, uh, we drew upon our own cultural knowledge. We drew upon our own personal journeys. We drew upon our own selves and our own histories. The people that came through our training program, which lasted for a number of years, um, had some of them had trained in other institutions, conventional institutions. So they already had made a commitment to their craft and the development of their craft. But when they came in to work on our pilot project, it was that they brought their culture with them. They brought their nativeness, their Indianness, their Aboriginal self, however you want to talk about that. They brought that into the room. And it was important that as we developed um, the community audiences, that those people were able to showcase their work. You didn't have to be, uh, you know, have graduated from some program and be in some theater program and do a well-written play. You could create a show, it would assist you, it would help to devise the work. In whatever form it came was so very important. It was not uh, a prescribed uh, formula for creating the well-written play or the well-written poem or whatever. And in that way, the uh, multiplicity of form, um, which is part of our Talking City Festival, was really, is really affirmed because people come to the arts from a variety of other places. And I'm most concerned with our young people. I'm concerned with our old people. 
I'm concerned with our society specifically and generally. I want our own people to be inspired by our own stories. And the way we want to tell that story is the way we want to tell that story. And we need to affirm that. And so part of what we're really developing is uh, in our festival, it took a long time because people didn't want to come into the theater. They weren't familiar spaces for them to go. So we did the show in their community center. We did the show in the, the cafe that they hang out. We did the show in the theater. We did the show in the theater in their neighborhood. And slowly, slowly over time, the audience knows that they are being represented on that stage. Their youth are doing the slam poetry. Their elders are part of the stage reading. Their people are being represented on the stage. And it's really about encouraging the voice of our people for the healing of our people. And what I always believe is the artist, the storyteller, is part of that sacred circle of teachers and masters within our communities. They're as important as the medicine. They're as important as the educators. They're as important as the hunters and the, and the, and the people who are keeping the fields going and raising the babies. They are vital to the development of our community and the well-being of our community. Si quieres responder algo en la conversación y en tu propio contexto. Cuando yo llegué a Nicaragua, como les expliqué, yo, yo me sentía eh, con el temor de que apareciera mi voz. Yo me dediqué a trabajar en la problemática política, la problemática social del pueblo nicaragüense. Entonces no quería que saliera mi propia voz como mexicana. Eh, when uh, I first came to Nicaragua, I was concerned with not putting my own voice into the work that was being presented, the work that we were doing. It was wanted to uh, uh, have the people, the Nicaragua people, to say their own, their own stories, their own words, not my own because I'm uh, messy tuvieron que pasar muchos años para que yo me diera el permiso de subirme yo al escenario y poder plantear problemáticas que venían de mi identidad, de mis orígenes, porque yo realmente también soy mexicana. It took a long time for me to have uh, the courage and the will to be on stage to tell these stories and tell them from my own perspective, out of respect and, out of, and also presenting my own views as, as, uh, as Mexican. Y monté, por ejemplo, he montado dos obras muy personales, Hay Amor, Ya No Me Quieras Santo, que parte de, de los de recuerdos que yo tenía de niña cuando yo viajaba, y esa sensación que tenía los viajes entre el miedo a lo desconocido y, y la alegría de encontrarte con algo nuevo. Um, one of my stories, ¿cómo se llama? Sí, hay amor, ya no me quieras tanto. Hay amor, ya no me quieras tanto. Oh, love, 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 love you so much. So, I remember this is of her traveling and that feeling of traveling and coming back home. Uh, she was like, she wrote this and she wrote another play too. de la obra que el público nicaragüense, a pesar de que es una obra muy personal, eh, se identificaba profundamente y terminaba con la lágrimas. Ha viajado por 10 festivales internacionales y cada vez que la presentamos en Nicaragua, la gente la ama. Cuando uno habla con sinceridad, los problemas son comunes para eh, cualquier cultura, que eh, nos unen las, las relaciones humanas. Y eh, también, bueno, sí. Sí. Um, what she means by saying this is that when you speak sincerely and from the heart and you tell your stories that are intimate and from your heart, we all are connected because they're human stories. They're not from one culture or another. Um, we're going to, uh, we, we've got a little less than half an hour left, we're going to move to our closing, but I want to remind
and the live audience here, if you have a question, you can write it uh, on a sticky note and someone will bring it up to me, and then we'll see uh, if there are any questions we can take in this time. Um, uh, also, we agreed on a, a final question that we want um, everyone on the panel to offer an answer to, but uh, primero, first I want to lift up uh, this, this theme that is coming forward for me quite strongly about agency over our own aesthetics and, uh, and the, the value of multiplicity uh, of aesthetics in, in, in terms of um, seeking an inclusion that represents all of our communities. And uh, that's something that I think we're here together to explore uh, at the Institute um, over the next 10 days. Um, but this question of how we have agency over, over our own aesthetics and as, uh, as artists of color, uh, in the context of the Institute, uh, women directors, women in leadership, uh, LGBTQ and trans identified artists, um, and artists of color and indigenous artists who uh, have, are struggling against these oppressive systems and forces in our lives and in our work, um, colonization and patriarchy and all the various forms of oppression that we are constantly managing, um, how, how we um, create a career, create an aesthetic, and maintain agency over our own voices and stories, and how we work together, and how we collaborate, uh, and, and what, um, what are the, the challenges that we can work through together in that process. So these are some of the things that we've been talking about and will continue talking about. Uh, and um, I offer that as something to reflect on, perhaps, as we enter the final question. But the final question that we discussed over lunch is, what are you going to do next? What are the books? Yeah, what is the next project, the new aesthetic you're evolving, the next story you need to tell? Uh, and, it, and it brings us back to this question, what are we going to do, how will we do it, and what will we become? Uh, so who would like to share first what like, the next yeah. phase of the work is for you? Oh, now they're shy. <laughs> <laughs> well, just as there are multiple stories to be told, I think there are multiple interventions to be made. Yeah. Okay? And it may be that my intervention may not find its language through theater. It could be that my intervention could find its language through the creation of an ensemble of artists as you have gathered here, which is a remarkable achievement. Just to bring diversity in a real sense into a space, you know, where instead of ghettoizing diverse communities, which has been the multicultural policy so far. You know, creating ghettos out of you know, differences. Differences should be fluid. You know? If they're not fluid, if they're not in dialogue, then they freeze, they, they harden. And there are borders, there are multiple borders that get created in the process. So for me, today, the idea of creative work, it can go in many directions, you know? And I would perhaps like to sort of take uh, the inspiration I've received from this ensemble and see where I could go with it in different locations. One thing that really concerns me is the creation of new dramaturgies, you know? This is what really uh, you know, fires me. And I think dramaturgy in some way it can mean many things, but like how do you tell your own story? You know, how do you take possession of what of your own language, of your own body? You know? I, I'm really interested in this and I there's no one dramaturgy. I mean this is all that nonsense that one can learn at school, you know. And you go back to the German models and you know, the way Bertolt Brecht was a dramaturg for his scuffle. That, that's okay, that's history, but it's not going to help us, I think, beyond the point. And therefore, to create new dramaturgies coming out of those communities who frankly have their own dramaturgies already, you know, 
the indigenous community and, and all of by what one can learn. So this is what will find me to extend the learning process by opening myself, especially to, uh, to those marginalized experiences that contain some seeds of knowledge that can be nurtured and translated. Well, in Canada, 
challenging time as the national government out of one side of their mouth they say that we want to reconcile with indigenous peoples of the land. Out of the other side of their mouth, all their bureaucrats, not all of them, but many of them are still very colonial, very internal, and still we're still fighting with them to really give us the rights to say that they acknowledge. So at the same time, the murdered and missing women and girls has achieved an incredible national um, movement. Before that was Idle No More, or almost at the same time was Idle No More, as the people begin to rise up. This is an incredible um, guerrilla theater happens in the streets um, with these movements. And so as I am living on the edge of the Pacific Rim, far away from some of the fray. I am, my new office and studio is just down the street from the darkest corner of Skid Row in Canada, where there's an incredible uh, opioid crisis, where uh, many women murdered and missing women. Uh, their DNA was found on a pig farm just outside the city in recent years. And so this, you're balancing the light and the dark, the hope and the sorrow and grief. And you're living with that contradiction. And I have to say I'm very fortunate. As I said, I was loved. I didn't realize, even in my identity crisis that I went through, how much love can, can keep you going. Even when you feel you're alone and you're struggling on your own or anything else. And what we've been doing with the Talking Sea Festival is gathering people in our industry series. I'd love to find uh, an indigenous way to describe that in the series. And we've been trying to indigenize the things that we do. And we've been gathering our little ensembles and we've been gathering people uh, to, to have the conversations that need to be had among the artists. And at first the non-native artists, the white artists didn't come. And we kept inviting them, and we kept inviting people. Then the funders started to come. The, 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 everything started to shift because the priority was to, to include indigenous voices and include uh, racialized artists, artists of color, um, in the funding. There's still issues, there's still major issues, and our young people are still, you know, thinking that to be on the stage of the Arts Club would be, you know, the pinnacle of their, their career, when I know it's not. So the conversations that we've begun are really important for us as a community, but also of our allies, and, and it helps us to develop those um, facilitated, safely facilitated conversations where we can raise the issues and talk to each other and share with each other inspire each other about looking within and within our own cultural practice and uh, lifting that up. It means also when we're working with non-native companies, we're, we're getting into a crisis situation again with not just the, the Robert Lepage, but within our communities, our smaller communities, as the truth and reconciliation, you know, um, 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 energy is People are saying, well, let's let's reconcile with the Indians. Well, let's I'll tell your story for you, and you can you can be my assistant, and you can feed me, and I can tell your story for you. You know, there's still this colonized approach to things, but we need to talk about it, and we need to also speak up together, and we need to come together more regularly and talk about those things. So, as an elder sister in my community. That's been my journey to bring people together, to find ways to advance the conversation. And for myself, I would say that along, along this journey has meant that my own artistic practice has, has slipped to the side. And so what am I going to do next? Well, there has been a, a, a change in my life. A big change, a very tough change. But through coming through that, I have a studio 
studio, we have an offices finally and a studio connected, where the administrators and the administrative people are not separate from the rehearsal room, where the artists and, and the administrative people and the support people can be together, work together, where the community at large, like there's been no place for, for our performing artists to gather. There's no place for us to come together and have the conversations and have a barbecue and have fun and show our work. There's just been no place for our people when they come in to do a film or TV show or something. They don't, there's nowhere for us to go. So we're very excited to have a place where we can begin to gather more regularly. Where we can begin to have those conversations to inspire each other. And where I can begin to go into the rehearsal studio every morning before I go and sit on my computer and uh, roll around on the floor and sing to my heart's content. <laughs>
going to conclude the conversation for now. And it, I, I am extremely uh, grateful that we have this time together to continue the conversation over the next several days with all of you and with everyone here that is at the Institute. Um, and uh, I just want us to always celebrate uh, our courage, our creativity, our determination, and the brilliance that comes from making even the most painful moments in our lives into art and into beauty. The transformation that all of us, all of you do in all of the work that we create. And hopefully, what we will do together uh, over the next 10 days, but also um, into the future as we remain colleagues uh, and friends and people in this work and this struggle and this creativity together. So thank you all. Um, honored to be with you all. And I hope you all all safe.